Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID-19 debunking video. Imagine if flat earthers suddenly believed that they were experts in biological sciences. Well, then you'd have the topic of this week's video, virus deniers. These are people who actually believe that viruses can't make us sick because they don't exist. Yeah, pretty crazy. But before you think that these people are just laughing stocks or low-hanging fruit, I would argue that if you leave people like this to their echo chambers, they only gain in influence and numbers until they become a big problem. That's why I've taken the time before on this channel to address people like this, even confront them directly in their own webinars, and why this week I'm going to be debunking one of their biggest ringleaders, Stefan Lanka. So strap in, this is going to be a pretty crazy one, but I'm going to be bringing up a lot of cool science that will all be linked in the description below for you to check out yourself. Let's get started. So the clips of the video you're about to see are from an interview where Thomas Cowan, who I've covered before on this channel, interviews Stefan Lanka. And right in the beginning, he starts talking about viruses for bacteria, or otherwise known as bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. And right away, he has some very interesting things to say about these very well-known viruses. Get ready. And in bacteria, they are called bacteriophages. Phage from phagocytosis to eat, to swallow. But those structures are not eating the bacteria. This is a misconception. This is already, you know, uh, uh, a very narrowed view to the things. Uh, when bacteria are dying, it must be a virus, right? So, but in the end, uh, it's a mini spores which can themselves develop again into larger units. I can just feel the pain of every microbiologist and virologist and biologist in general who might be watching this video. I know, yes, he did just say that bacteriophages are spores that will turn into bacteria. Wow. So for those who don't know, some bacteria, not all, have the ability to form spores when conditions get rough. These spores will essentially protect a copy of the bacteria's genome, so that when conditions become favorable again, the spore can basically unpackage that bacterial genome and a new bacteria cell can form. It's a way for the bacteria to protect itself when conditions are tough. These spores can be detected in a light microscope with a particular staining technique. Here is what they look like. The spores are the teal greenish structures that you see in this image here. They are much, much bigger than viruses that infect bacteria. They are completely different in structure and completely different in their composition. Here is what a bacteriophage might look like. It is orders of magnitude smaller than a spore or a bacteria. It looks completely different. It has its own unique genome. It has its own unique proteins and its own unique structure. And of course, this specific genome is far from capable of coding for an entire new bacteria cell. That is completely wild and honestly one of the funniest things that Stefan Lanka says. The reality is that many bacteriophages actually kill bacteria. This can be easily measured in an experiment called a plaque assay. This is an experiment where an isolated bacteriophage is diluted over a series of tubes, and each dilution can be plated onto a plate of full bacteria. If there's a lot of phage present, as you see towards the left-hand side of this image, you get complete lysis, or a complete destruction of the bacterial lawn. And as you dilute the bacteriophage more and more, you see less and less cell death. You can then pick out virus from any of these individual circles where a bacteriophage landed and started killing the bacteria cells, and further propagate that one bacteriophage colony. And then you can repeat the process all over again. This is not a toxin. It is not a chemical. It is an infectious replicating virus. And as we'll see later in this video, you can do these similar techniques with viruses that infect human cells as well. This is all very basic biology and virology that Stefan Lanka completely denies. But, I mean, after all, that's why he is the flat earther of biology. So in the rest of this interview, Stefan Lanka goes through seven points that he thinks destroys all of virology. And I'm going to address every single one of them. The first step I mentioned already. Since Enders, every virology, virologist believes when his cell cultures are dying in the test tube, right, that the, there must have been a virus, but they never controlled it. So we controlled it twice already, 
and we get the cells dying without infectious, infectious material. So this is what you'll hear many Stefan Lanka followers repeating ad nauseum. He is basically saying that if you take an experiment like what I just showed you, a plaque assay with bacteria, and do something similar with human cells, that there's never a control for it, and that the cells will just die anyway, whether or not there's a virus. It's complete baloney. Experiments like this always have a control. Always. Often it's called a mock infection. Here is a great example of this that even goes a step further. This is an example of a paper where they looked at Japanese encephalitis virus and how it infects human cells. This is a picture of a plaque assay, just like how I showed you with bacteria, except with human cells. And what the researchers did was they mutated the virus. So they were able to reduce the size and number of the plaques just by mutating the genome of the specific virus. And yes, they included mock controls in their studies. What Stefan Lanka is most likely describing in his experiments is his inability to culture cells properly. It's not hard to culture cells properly, but if you don't do it properly, the cells will die. So that's probably what Lanka is doing, and then he's observing his cells dying without a virus, and he's saying, oh look, I don't need a virus for cells to die, when really he's just bad at cell culture. But there's no way to tell this for sure because he doesn't publish any of his results. Anyway, here's also a picture of that Japanese encephalitis virus from that paper I just talked about. This was taken with a cryo-electron microscope at high resolution. And just for fun, in all of Stefan Lanka's points, I'll be providing pictures of viruses in high resolution. Their structures are unique. Their genomes are unique. They exist. They can make us sick. Let's keep going. The next step, what they are doing, they use uh, particles inside the tissue, they fix the tissue and uh, cut it in thin slices, thin slices, and look through the electron microscope. And they find some typical structures of dying cells, VLE, you know, some tissue dots, they, they walk like uh, 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 amoebs. And when they cut through with the electron microscope, uh, they show only the circles and claim, oh, those are viruses. Cryo-electron microscopes can specifically identify viruses because they are powerful enough for us to see the actual structure and amino acid side chains of the proteins that make up the viral capsid. The sequence of these amino acids have to be coded for by a genome. And the sequence of these amino acids in these proteins that we observe are specifically matched to the genome of the virus. Here's another example of a cryo-electron microscope taking a picture of a virus. This time it's HIV. On the left you can see viral particles in all sorts of different orientations, but in each case you can see that there is an envelope with contents on the inside. Those contents are the viral capsid. Here's another paper taking pictures of HIV, and you can see the structure of the viral capsid itself without the envelope. Again, accompanying all these images in all of these papers are genetic and biochemical analyses of the genomes and the proteins of the virus. So just like how flat earthers deny that pictures of the earth exist, these virus deniers deny that pictures of viruses exist. Then point three is they come up with another sort of, of particles uh, claiming uh, where they said, oh, those are viral particles. And um, if you go into the technical uh, details, you easily see that they uh, centrifuge all the, the proteins in the test tube down to, uh, to, uh, to the button. And then they take it up with a syringe and mix it. And so they vortex <laughs> this mixture out of proteins, fatty acid, and detergents. And what we have, we have soap bubbles. <sighs> That's right, he just said that viral particles are soap bubbles. First of all, that's not how people purify viruses in order to do cryo-electron microscopy. There are actually several ways that people prepare viruses for cryo-electron microscopy, but one typical way is to clean up the sample by multiple rounds of centrifugation. This essentially removes all of the debris and larger particles that are way too big to be viruses. Then they further clean it up using what we call a sucrose cushion or sucrose gradient. 
You can read about this in the papers that I'm providing in the description, but essentially it's a way to make this sample very, very clean so that they can get very good cryo-electron microscopy images. If the sample was not clean, they wouldn't be able to get high resolution structures. Here's another paper taking electron microscopy pictures of the measles virus. This is not a soap bubble. This is an envelope containing very specific viral capsids on the inside. Again, all of these proteins are exactly what we'd expect given the sequence of the genome. Soap bubbles, wow. Fourth point, the fourth step what they are doing from billions of small genetic debris, they are sequencing, they read the sequence of very small pieces and then they add them up to a, a large piece. They add them up and this process is called alignment. And uh, it's, it's, it's incredible that they never ever carried out a, a control experiment with equally treated cell cultures, equally treated cell culture, and just doing the same. Yep, this is another very common claim by virus deniers that I've actually addressed before on this channel with my buddy Senstrand when we took down Andrew Kaufman. Basically, this is a total misunderstanding of how next-gen sequencing works. I'll put a link in the description to a very good video explanation of how next-gen sequencing works. But for this video, all you need to know is that it's a very, very large-scale version of the by-hand way that people use to sequence genomes. What you end up with at the end of all of these reactions are millions and millions of what we call reads. Each read does only cover a small segment of the genome, but each segment is covered by many individual repeats of that read, and these reads overlap with each other significantly. Since all of these reads came from one individual genome, it's not hard to put them back together like a giant puzzle, and they do only all fit together one way and you can repeat this, and you don't recover the same viral genome from an uninfected cell culture. If you don't believe me, you can use BLAST tools on NCBI's website in order to look for genes of viruses in host genomes. You won't find them, and if you don't understand what I'm talking about, then you have a lot to learn before you deny virology. Oh, and by the way, here's a structure and image of another virus. This time, it's hepatitis B. Point five. In order to build a genome uh, of the virus, when they came up, oh, I, I find a new virus in Wuhan, or I repeat the experiment, they always need a given genome as an, a point of orientation where they add the smaller pieces, where they do fit to. No, you don't. In every sequencing experiment, you walk away with a full genome. You then take that full genome and you figure out what it is by comparing it to a reference database. By comparing the genome that you have recovered in your experiment to the wealth of sequencing data that has been accumulated over the years, you can learn something about your genome. You can learn what family it belongs to. You can learn maybe what species it is. You can learn if it's completely new. This is blatant denial of very basic molecular biology. And continuing the fun, here's another cryo-electron microscope image of another virus. This time it's hepatitis C. And as a bonus, this figure is even showing the difference between what a hepatitis C viral particle looks like and what an exosome looks like. They're all labeled individually. And I, as soon as I get hold of original sequence data, which was produced for HIV, I'm going to produce you coronavirus. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, yeah, so this isn't one of his points, but I just had to include it. It's complete crazy town, and I love that he's actually claiming he can do this. So we'll all wait with bated breath while Stefan Lanka works on this experiment. So let's come to point uh, six, you know. Everybody thinks, and it was your question uh, at yeah. the beginning, if uh, that, that virus never ever saw a virus inside a living being or inside its liquids. And it's easy. Everybody can check it easily on every single photograph of a virus, which could which should show a virus, you'll find the notion that it's from a cell culture, but never from the blood, never from the salvia, never from the semen, never from another liquid of the body, never from a lymph node, never from, from, from inside. 
Here are images of SARS-CoV-2 in a post-mortem patient tissue sample. The researchers of this paper were also able to track the path of the virus through different human tissues by detecting the specific viral genome in many human organs and also doing histopathology to look at the damage it was causing. So there you go, Lanka. I just showed you what you claim doesn't exist. And the reason that many papers that do cryo microscopy on viral particles took it from a cell culture is because they have to scale up in order to have enough viral particles in order to get a good high resolution image of the virus. For example, here is a beautifully high resolution structure of the Zika virus. This structure was only possible because the cryo-electron microscope had to look at hundreds of thousands of good clean viral particles in order to build the structure. This requires having a good clean homogeneous sample, which you're not going to get unless you scale up the number of viral particles in your sample and then clean it up. And the only way to do that is by growing them in cell culture. These again are basics that Lanka doesn't understand or just denies outright. Ah, the seven point, it's easy. Um, in this review where I, was, I spoke about of the Max Planck Institute um, on history of science, there you can read that uh, when the old biology was disproving itself themselves, they find out when they took out uh, uh, animal experiments, they never ever were able to transmit the disease. This is once again complete denial. But what better way to disprove this than by going through the example of SARS-CoV-2? In the description of this video, you'll find links to a list of several studies that together demonstrate that SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that causes COVID. This list includes studies where isolated virus was used to infect non-human primates and mice, and that infection led to disease in these animals. I talk about these studies more in depth in some of my other videos, but I promise you if you send this list of studies to anybody who denies that SARS-CoV-2 is a real virus that causes COVID, they will have a meltdown. As if that wasn't enough for Lanka, though, I'm also including some studies where human challenge experiments were done with influenza virus. These are studies where human subjects are directly given influenza virus, and they get infected, they have a specific immune response, and they may develop disease. And for fun, of course, here's another beautifully high-resolution structure, this time of dengue virus. Just to reiterate again, this is a unique structure made by unique proteins coded for by a unique genome. I think the bottom line here, Stefan, if you agree, is that it's the, the chemistry and the, and the structure follows consciousness, not the other way around. That's it. And that's, that's the most the important thing. Whatever that means. Well, there you have it. That is Stefan Lanka, the virus denier and flat earther of biology, completely debunked. If you're wondering why, why does Stefan Lanka, Tom Cowan, Andrew Kaufman, and all of their crony friends continue to perpetuate this wacky idea that viruses don't exist? Well, maybe it has something to do with their webinars that they put on, where each one rakes in tens of thousands of dollars. Like I said, this group is hilarious, but they are not just a laughing stock. They gain influence and numbers the more we ignore them. So make sure that you are aware that they are out there, and they are stupid, so that you or your friends don't get sucked in. Well, that was a very fun video for me to make. I sure hope you all enjoyed it as well. As I said, the links to all of the scientific papers that I show in this video are linked in the description below so that you can check them out for yourself and maybe learn something along the way. Thank you all so much for watching, and I do hope you'll subscribe so that you'll join me next time where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.